Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to conclude of grammatology starting with the second half titled Nature, Culture, and Writing. Now before jumping into that, you know, check out last week's episode because you'd be totally confused if you just started here. But if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can do that at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you're listening to this on YouTube, you can find it in podcast form anywhere where you get podcasts pretty much where there won't be any ads or anything uh, or vice versa if you want to watch YouTube videos where I have videos sometimes. If you want to help me out, keep, you know, keep me motivated to keep doing these, uh, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, you know, leave five stars, leave reviews. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and yeah, uh, you can help out monetarily as well if you want via the links in the description, but obviously no pressure. So let's jump into this, uh, starting with the very beginning of the second part, the age of Rousseau or introduction to the age of Rousseau. So Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Jean-Jacques Rousseau exemplifies for Derrida this logocentric logic, so to speak, in that he is the mark of the what he calls Derrida calls the reduction of the trace. So as I talked about in the last episode, talking about the trace as that view upon writing as supplement, as a thing that is detached from the truthfulness or the kind of godly logos-like nature of speaking of the immediacy and presence of speech. Rousseau is a figure that tries to shut that out. But beyond Rousseau, he's also going to talk quite a bit about Lévi-Strauss. And we're going to start, at least that puts us into chapter one, the violence of the letter from Lévi-Strauss to Rousseau. And Derrida begins by asking, how can a writing be violent? Or how can writing be considered violent? Which is an idea that permeates through Lévi-Strauss and Rousseau. They think writing is something that imparts itself upon a people to oppress them, to hierarchize them, to class them, or whatever, which is a mark of violence. So before jumping into this, Derrida kind of meditates on what discourse is and what a text is. So for him, discourse is the present living conscious representation of a text within the experience of a person who writes or reads it. So a discourse is determined by the situation they find themselves in, the experience of the person. So for example, I assume a different kind of discursive character in how I speak, depending on who I'm with. If I'm with uh, family members, I speak one way. If I'm with friends, I speak another way. If I'm among colleagues, I speak another way. When I'm on this channel, I'm speaking another way. And that determines the extent to which there's always a kind of flux in the way that this discourse is forming. And this discourse is only ever a kind of snapshot of text or of a text that we are always within. It is only one infinitesimal moment within it. And it comprises that text, or at least discourse comprises that text. And so it is technically, it's impossible for us to actually develop a history of the text because the text is comprised of all these I'll just say rhizomatic um, moments that don't necessarily have a direct affiliation or connection with one another. And so we can't think of the text as a straight line or as a telos, a telos being uh, going from point A to point B, having like a sequence. But he uses interesting imagery here and he describes it having like a kind of root system, uh, like uh, chasin, like um, having these uh, kind of subterranean structures without these subterranean structures kind of housing it kind of um, limiting its potential so the way i like to think about it is imagine a group of people that have just found themselves within a fog like a fog has rolled in over these group this group of people now let's imagine each person as discourse and the group of and the, and the fog i should say as the text each person might lose sight of the other embracing only their immediate surroundings that is their their own discourse within the text but they can't actually get a full glimpse of the text they can only get part of it or there's that old um i don't even know what to call it parable i don't know the the thing where you have blindfolded people touching like parts of the elephant and one person touches the trunk and thinks it's a snake and another person touches the the foot or hoof or whatever and calls it a like a tree trunk or a tr stump or, or something and you know 
all on their own they have uh, their own image of the thing that they can't actually construct a full image of now for Derrida it's not like you can take off the blindfold and then see what you know the thing actually is because we can't actually see that which is why I prefer the fog uh, imagery you can't actually see fog in its entirety even though it engulfs you it envelops you so this text is the logic of the trace of difference which always implies difference transformation becoming I'll, I'll just say that gives possibility to history because it gives possibility to everything and it is the thing and therefore logocentrism but it is also the thing that evades a kind of grounding by logocentrism by history it is it is refused itself an origin because you know that would actually it doesn't have an origin but that doesn't mean that logocentrism doesn't come in and say we are going to impart upon you an origin that can then be the transcendental signified the kind of originary point from which everything emanates so it's only within the text with something like logocentrism that we see the formation of various uh sites of various different centers that can be construed to be true or having like origin points or having like a kind of permanence to them within the text and one such thing would be like science that is accredited to often just to humanity it is being the thing that is meant to explain humanity by through the exclusion of writing and we will come to see in Rousseau how uh, passion which is a human phenomenon is associated with uh, speech the origins of language through speech which is privileged and we see that being you know only reserved for humans essentially along with writing so levi strauss took up this idea from rousseau about the passions or about passion not the passions about passion in motivating language but he did it kind of in his own way in his own anthropological way to also consider the distinction between like nature and culture and also writing and speech and for a more detailed presentation of this i've covered structure sign and play in which derrida talks about this a little bit more specifically the way that levi strauss takes up the idea of the prohibition of incest which is pretty important but we'll we'll return to that in a bit for now let's talk about the way that derrida chooses to focus on another prohibition which is the prohibition of proper names so derrida recounts that in levi strauss who had visited what are called uh, the Nambic Nambicwara people, Levi Strauss had a moment in which he saw these two uh, young girls fighting one another. And it, I think it came down to fisticuffs and one hit the other. Um, and in order to take revenge upon the one that had hit the other, the one who was hit went up to Levi Strauss and said, told him, whispered to him, the other girl's, proper name her first name because for some reason no one would divulge their name no one would tell Levi Strauss or the other anthropologists who anyone was and who knows like I'm not going to say why that was the case I have no idea but then Levi Strauss exploited this and he used that little girl who to essentially get all the names of all the residents which was obviously an asshole thing to do like if if it is a sacred right not to you know tell maybe it was just to outsiders your name maybe this guy can respect that but anyways he exploits that among the people but levi strauss looks upon this and thinks wow this is the kind of privilege that is allotted to people without writing like they can keep secrecy they can keep themselves separate they are innocent to some extent in that they don't have these kinds of records or history that can mar their uh, kind of immediate cultural identity so this might seem like okay i'm on board here but derrida says this is quite ethnocentric and it's quite eurocentric because what levi strauss is doing is saying that these people are more innocent because they don't have writing they have only speech and that makes them more innocent and Derrida reminds us, no, because speech is in itself a kind of writing. Now, Derrida also says that it, in this text that Levi Strauss is writing here, Levi Strauss also acknowledges that these people have a word for writing uh, that translates literally into drawing lines. 
So they they had these kind of scribbles around even before the uh, anthropologists arrived. And Derrida is like, isn't that writing? How can you say that that's not writing or not look at that as though it's writing? And But that's a kind of superficial um, point to make. It doesn't actually perform this task of deconstruction. But Derrida is still like, come on. Like, clearly, they have writing. But in a more abstract way, Derrida reasons that these people have a writing because they are able to hide their speech. Because if speech was truly this thing that signified a kind of immediate presence, it was a thing that was like always there as logos, as, as speaking word of God through self-presence, then you wouldn't be able to just hide it away. Hiding would be the thing reserved to the dead language like writing. So this demonstrates the extent, the connection between speech and writing, how they aren't totally separate. And Derrida maintains that in any act of speaking, what Levi Strauss would would see as being the um, a sign of giving like a proper name up. So Levi Strauss says they are hiding their proper names from me. They are keeping them secret. Derrida responds by saying, "No, when you speak the proper name, you are making it secret," which might seem totally weird. Like, wait, what does that mean? Derrida maintains that the the name or the word sorry, the spoken word is a secrecy in that it veils the thing under which it is speaking about because it stands in for the thing that it is speaking about because it is only another representation. So it is wrong to think that underneath that secrecy is the truth of the proper name when in fact there's there's nothing underneath. It, it, it only hides the fact that there is nothing underneath. And Levi Strauss extends this to say that these people are without violence. They are they are peaceful people because they don't have writing. Writing is what gives them like uh, violence, and it is Europeans bringing violence to these people with writing. Where uh, he gave out these pencils to them to to kind of get them to write or to mimic him, and he saw that with that there was the consolidation of the authority of the tribal leader because. He was the one that could then use that writing against the people as he was taught it. But Derrida is like, you do know that there was this hierarchy before you arrived, right? Like, they had these systems before you came. It's not as though writing is going to, like, completely bring about violence, as though violence is ex doesn't exist before writing. And we can see the same thing in uh, Deleuze and Guattari when they write about the way that uh, so-called nomadic people actually internalize many elements of the state within them. They do not stand opposed to the state. They actually have parts of it within them, just like these people have writing just in their speech. So all of this that Levi Strauss espouses here, even though it might seem to be kind of progressive because he's saying these people are innocent and pure and Europe is violent and, and uh, you know, classed and, and whatever, Derrida's like, what you are actually doing is maintaining a distinction between us and them that is imminent to a kind of binary logic, or that is part of a kind of binary logic, but that is imminent to logocentrism. And another thing Derrida says, he's like, if writing is this like amazing thing, that this kind of, uh, you know, exteriority that seems to come from without, it seems to have very little effect on on what on the human genome essentially like we've remained pretty much the same for 60,000 years it doesn't seem like writing ushered in all that much difference like it was other technologies that did now with that being said Derrida is not saying that writing is not inconsequential he's saying that it has effects but he's also just demonstrating that we've it, you know it's wrong to say that it just emerged in like as a representation of spoken word it is part of that very word and that puts us here into chapter two, that dangerous supplement is what it's called. So now it's time to consider Husseau a little bit more closely here, and that'll probably take up the rest of the text. So Husseau looked upon writing as a dead language, which I think you can already get from this. However, he was a little more ambiguous about what this meant. So it seems that he drew life from the deadness, a site of comparison to accentuate proper speech. And so it has revealed his ambiguity about speech because it is not prima facie alive. 
speech can be dead speech of like government speech, for example, and like Husserl. So Husserl believed that writing was something that would be used to control people like Levi-Strauss. Levi-Strauss took that from Husserl, I should say. Um, in the same way, he says that writing can be either kind of good or bad, and the same can happen for speech. So he uses writing as a dead thing, kind of assumed about to be dead thing, just to vitalize or revitalize speech as a living thing, like a point of comparison to give speech a kind of lifeness. So this is revealed in the way that Rousseau assigns to the written word the status of a supplement. So in his words, as substitute, it is not simply added to the positivity of a presence, it produces no relief. Its place is assigned in the structure of the mark of an emptiness. And the supplement essentially procures, it kind of accrues or uh, amasses, an absent present through its image. So it, it simulates a presence, but that, that is an absent presence, of course. But such a supplement couldn't be possible unless the thing that it was supplementing was in itself a supplement. So like I said in the first episode, that in order for the signifier to exist, there had needed to be a kind of um, homogenization of the signified. So too, must there be a kind of supplementality or a couple a kind of supplementarity of the thing the supplement is meant to supplement in order for the supplement to exist at all. That is, you can't have a representation of something unless it was in itself already a representation. And, you know, we could use Kant for this, like we're always, uh, we only ever deal with phenomena, not noumena, not things in themselves. But, you know, we can also um, defer this question to the problem of power, you know, and who gets to decide what we are representing and how that constitutes and shapes and frames the way that things will be represented, calling attention to the assumed reality or truth of the thing being represented. Or we can think of this in any number of ways. It's just, it's up to you. But here we get the famous line that essentially writing underwrites all, where he says that there is nothing outside of the text. There are only always ever substitutes, substitutions, différence, the trace, a kind of perpetual tracing of things that is revealed both in language, that is spoken language and written language. And this might explain as well how or why in the text Derrida refers to Jean-Jacques Rousseau at times as Jean-Jacques and at times as Rousseau. Like he's playing with these kinds of transformations, these kinds of substitutions. And here that propels us into chapter three, Genesis and structure of the essay on the origin of languages. So here, and I, I want to say that Derrida talks a lot about Husserl here on the origin of languages, which I've covered, so I guess, two weeks ago now. You can listen to that if you want, or just read it. It's real short. I'm not obviously going to cover everything that Derrida covers because it's it's long, um, but I'm I'm just presenting the kind of highlights of it. Now, with that being said, if you want the full experience, you obviously have to read it all, but Anyways, just kind of putting it out there, just giving you the highlights. So in the act of speaking, we are doubling ourselves. We, we are representing ourselves through, through words. So the words we speak must affirm us as what he calls auto-affection. So they are sheltered within the pure interiority of auto-affection. So it therefore works to suppress difference and consequently proffer the illusion of immediacy and presence. So when we speak, we are still, at least within this paradigm, maintaining the idea of auto-affection, a kind of interiority, origin from which the words emanate, the thoughts that give them a kind of uh, potency, give them, a, give them their potential. And with that, of course, is, comes an appreciation of presence, of immediacy, where you try to connect with other people, in as pure a fashion as possible, like through speech as opposed to writing. And we hear, we hear this echoed a lot in, um, in media studies in the work of uh, John Durham Peters, who I've covered on this channel as well that you can listen to, where there's a kind of um, a fantasy about communication being between like angels, like spirits, where spirits can exist right on top of one another and there's perfect communication 
where absolutely no, no, nothing is lost. There's, there's no misunderstanding allowed. That is the dream of communication here. And it is one that is really proffered up by logocentrism. But of course, logocentrism and Western metaphysics as its kind of um, child can never think this fact. Because if it did, it would undo itself completely. It can't come to terms with the fact that uh, the idea of presence as it is appreciated is a total fabrication or it belongs to a specific time, to a specific logic of history, historicity, um, logocentrism that would simply undo it if it came to terms with it. So now moving back to Rousseau. So in the origin or in the essay on the origin of language, Rousseau equates speech with liberty and writing with non-liberty, essentially. So Derrida says that desire is that which tries to escape this binary, and desire for him, even though he only mentions it briefly, is an element of the trace, is an element of difference as opening up possibility for becoming, for change that escapes the binary of um, like speech and writing or presence and non-presence. So we keep going here. For, for Rousseau, passion and desire is what births language in the first place. So we can feel pity for others and we learn to express it verbally. Such is an extension and supplement to the natural order. Here it is revealed that the supplement produces categories of natural law and institutional law, which is just the same distinction between like speech and writing, natural law versus institutional law. So of course this is reveal, reveals another ambiguity between nature's writing that we saw in the last episode, like Plato and good writing, and reason's writing, which is, um, you know, viewed as being uh, bad writing. But anyways, for, for Rousseau, language emerges from passion and pity. So in the fact that we can recognize other people as others that are somewhat equal with us, we develop a capacity to communicate with them equally. And primarily, we develop that capacity to express ourselves and our feelings to others. And he talks about pity and our capacity to give pity to other people when we hear them speaking, and it, which extends beyond just sight. So in Rousseau, just to give a kind of brief recap, he says that if we see someone suffering, we can't help, like we can't feel pity for them because seeing is dead like and we he equates seeing with like reading words whereas hearing them tell us their story with speech then it can move us it can it can change us and so he identifies that within humans is not only um a need for like food and shelter and stuff but there's also a need for this kind of emotional connection that is only afforded by speech so Derrida identifies that there's a gendered component with this where um, women are associated with a kind of wild passion that isn't like lent to uh, like real expression of ex like experience and pain and, and suffering, but instead it's just like sensible signifier type passion, whereas men are associated with a kind of nat natural passion. And so it is as kind of preordained by nature for Rousseau, it is the job of men to restrain women. So this happens overtly, obviously, with like various you know structures put in place to uh, subordinate women, but it also manifests itself as a kind of self-surveillance um, in the way that women are expected to be like modest and to keep themselves under control. So modesty then, which is obviously a fabricated thing, a supplement, if you will, uh, reveals the intractability, the um, the untenability, or the uh, flimsiness of the monopoly of nature over order. Clearly, nature is not as potent as we believed. So we have this distinction between natural law and, and maybe cultural law. But if there was such a thing as nature, why do we have to erect these structures within cultural law to maintain that nature? If it was natural, then it should be fine on its own. It's like how um, people today, when discussing gender, are so worried that, you know, there's going to be, there's like an attack against like heterosexual couplings or like cis identities when they also say it's natural. 
it's like if it's natural how can it be under attack like if it if it's just ingrained within all of us how can we deviate from it unless of course there is a very strong social component to it so additionally in rousseau it is the task of nature to awaken human pity right where our capacity for speech comes from pity from passion but that is awakened by nature and derrida is like what the hell because that is only an artificial construction like it doesn't if if it wasn't always there then it must be contingent upon a kind of social dynamic or a geographical one or something so it's not like universal so in the consolidation of this kind of nature through an imagination that that wakes it we see the undoing of nature as universal because it completely undermines the idea that it is universal if it only comes about at a certain phase brought about in rousseau by imagination where derrida responds by saying that imagination is nonetheless itself a virtual faculty like it doesn't exist like as a thing in the world so beyond this discussion of pity derrida also considers the way that rousseau breaks up singing and 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 colors so we hear singing but we see colors so for rousseau singing is both a sign of a move from animality in the melodious melodious play of voice but it is also a kind of a return to nature like in the like we think of like bird songs or something where melody is a human faculty that is restricted to speaking but it harkens back to these natural sounds uh, and essentially a return to the melody of the world so derrida is obviously suspicious of this because he's like well you're just showing us that it is not this thing that is reserved for a kind of civilized way of being but that is found everywhere just like writing is found everywhere because he points out that it can't it can't be both it can't be that it's like this natural thing or this thing reserved for um kind of upper echelons of society so to speak and in uh Rousseau, there's a distinction between melody and harmony where harmony is the supplement harmony is the thing that is brought about by kind of ordering through culture and that he kind of admonishes for being uh, the destruction of melody. But in all of this is revealed within Rousseau a tension between good and bad imitations. Like he likes melody as imitation of nature and bird song, but he doesn't like writing as a kind of imitation of an imitation, so to speak. So in either case, we're speaking of an exterior reproduction of something by an other, by difference. We are seeing the operation of difference play out in both forms of imitation so it's in that way that derrida connects them and says look they're they're the same thing but Rousseau doesn't look upon it that way because then that would completely undermine his whole shtick it would completely undo everything he's trying to say that is privileging some forms of art above others you know privileging essentially western thought above others but it nevertheless reveals it to be true so in Derrida's words, if art operates through the sign and is effective through imitation, it can only take place within the system of a culture. And so Rousseau locates this kind of bad imitation with harmony that he assigns to Europe. And he says that, you know, other cultures that don't have writing and, and this kind of speech or song are more pure, closer to nature. And so we are hearing the echoes of Levi Strauss and his use of these other people to kind of proffer up a civility associated with European life, but that is then repudiated for its violence. And it just goes like there's so much more. It goes on and on and on the way that Derrida just kind of tears Rousseau apart. But another way is that in Rousseau, he says that people in northern cultures, in cold climates, develop language out of need. So it it's a really frustrating text because he starts out by saying there's passion that births language, but then he says it's need uh, for some people, which Derrida obviously makes his head spin. But you have in Northern cultures need because people have to be like always working to survive. Whereas people in more Southern climates where or warmer climates where they have uh, the world essentially giving them what they need, they have easy access to water and, and naturally growing fruit and food and, and, bountiful amounts of animals around derrida's like they can develop language out of passion or sorry rousseau says they can develop language out of passion because they have their needs more or less uh set out for them they they have them satisfied already so derrida's like well 
what is it like is there an origin to language or is it geographically specific is there a thing that gives birth to language is it need is it passion or is it just always contingent upon something else and if that's the case it demonstrates the demonstrates the extent to which it is not you know this kind of universal thing so derrida forces rousseau to confront his disdain of northern colder cultures as you know developing language just for need and not being like a kind of privileged site of language or being like developing language for like violent means just like getting through the day he calls that the kind of the becoming writing of language within rousseau as revealing fundamentally the space of writing operates at the origin of a language so those people in northern cultures articulate they, they articulate they they actually participate in articulation as opposed to speaking articulation is closer to writing for Rousseau and as Derrida reads it so it is within supplementarity with this articulation in these northern cultures that develop language as a kind of tool to be used um, that human is able to designate themselves as separate from nature nevertheless so in his words all concepts determining a non-supplementarity like nature or animality, belong moreover to the idea of truth itself, to an epoch of supplementarity. They have meaning only within, an, within a closure of the game, that is, difference. So they, only when there is a reduction of that world, to some extent, a foreclosure of difference, is there that potential for writing as a privileged site to emerge, but not privileged in that it is actively acknowledged to be privileged but as something that is positioned as a an association with with higher living like we saw at the very beginning of the book with hegel's quote and with uh, Rousseau's quote this recognition of civility or association of civility with the alphabet with writing so then we see in Rousseau uh, an emphasis on the shift from primitive life to civil life which is marked by an introduction of language, this shift. But if language were natural, why was it not always already here? Like if it, if it is this natural thing. This is the unintended trick of logocentrists. They proclaim the existence of God, for example, uh, which is adduced by nature. So they say they read nature like a book and say, oh, well, there's a structure here. So there must have been a creator, a designer, there's God. Nature does not yield such evidence directly it has to be read upon it however and so it is necessary to impart upon nature characteristics that affirm its homogeneity and therefore its design so such is done with the supplement that is also tacitly acknowledged to derive from without an exteriority to humanity and the world which then stands in as the possible existence of this god that is always seen as being exterior and therefore from god so logocentrism colonizes all domains on the service of itself, and it's really clever like that. And it is at this moment that deconstruction can get to work, because it reveals the extent to which the binary distinction shares a common ground that does not constitute, but is constituted by that very distinction that is logocentrism. So in a, in a binary relation, term A and term B of the binary, the two sides, are then not separate. They're revealed to be part of the same logic, the same binary logic of logocentrism. So such a shift then from primitive to civil life does not then exist as a sign of a burgeoning language, like language emerged and then uh, this could happen or was brought about by language. Because language was both before and after and both not before and after. That is, we've always had it, therefore we've also not had it. It's never like emerged. Derrida calls upon the prohibition of incest from structure, sign, and play, in how he, he writes about it there, to highlight this. So the prohibition of interest, interest, <laughs> the, the, uh, the prohibition of incest does not mark transition from nature to culture, as is often assumed, that like um, you pro prohibit incest and then suddenly opening yourself up to like civility. Because incest did not exist with, within nature. It was only born as something to be prohibited with culture. So that is to say that in the prohibition, in the, in the making 
incest illegal does not mark a shift into civilized living because such a restriction only exists within civilized living. So we know then that civilized living must have preceded the thing that it we believe it meant to have given it, uh, brought it into existence through the prohibition of incest. So we see then that the exteriority or the, the moment of possibility of civil life, civilization, of culture, was actually preceded by culture itself. And so we have this constant folding back upon itself. So the same can be said of language where we can't say there was present a kind of language before civil life because such a designation belongs to civil life itself. So when we look back upon certain cultures and say, oh, look, they uh, don't have language, the only way we are able to say that is because we exist in a world in which we have designated language to constitute or to resemble a certain thing that is then only forwarded to affirm that superior position of the place of the the civil life that is um, espousing that idea so not it's not as though one side can possibly be privileged over the other even though they are by looking at the kind of logocentric um, framing of the narrative but that the task here is to reveal that they are born of the same thing and then actually I should say that the often unvalorized term, the term B, I, I would say, actually constitutes, probably precedes even the formation of the binary itself, because it has to be the thing that must be issued to give birth to this new privileged thing. God, I hope that that was clear. <laughs> I don't, this this stuff is, you could probably find someone who explains it better than me, but it's uh, it's it's not easy. It's not easy. Okay, that puts us here into chapter four. From or of the supplement to the source, the theory of writing. So after having sketched out the theory, the origin of language, that is with this north-south um, apparent universality of the origin of language, even though they develop it differently, Rousseau begins to theorize language as though to play out the logocentric appreciation and centering of the origin in relation to everything else. So whereas language is metaphorical and is therefore connected to an origin via a string of representations, writing effaces origins, apparently, at least for Rousseau. So at the same time that humanity established the communicative foundation to acknowledge origins through writing, Rousseau is then uh, content to mark it as the death of the origin. Writing is, for Derrida then, life and death. So let me re rephrase that. It is viewed as though writing is the death of origins because it is free-floating signification that isn't tied to or directly connected to the thing it is representing. It's, it kind of goes on on its own accord. But we know that the only way we have any record of origins is through writing. So Derrida looks upon that and says, oh, well, isn't that interesting? Writing, as Arche writing, gives you know, us the possibility of origins, not because it embraces it itself, but because it, you know, comes about through that, or it's born within that kind of mist or that fog that then comes to stand in for Arche writing itself. And so writing as an excluded term within that is then, I guess, scapegoated as not having origins, even though it is constantly exploited for origins. So let's do some deconstruction here. We're at the origin for Rousseau in the primitive south, southern part of the world where it was warmer and people were speaking metaphorically. So they were speaking more directly in relation to the world, not in terms of like need uh, versus the person speaking literally, the, like the, um, the civil uh, person from the north. We see that in Rousseau, the metaphorical person from the South was living close, living closer to the truth of the world with their language, while the literal person, the person of the North, was the opposite. So Derrida thinks this can be reversed by allotting to non-literal metaphor, that is the people of the South, by way of its truthfulness, the status of more accurate representation, and the opposite for the other. So the literal person having less accurate representation. So in his words, even while affirming that the original language was figurative, 
Rousseau upholds the literal as Arche and as Telos. So this is essentially reveals the privileging of the literal, which is the North, even though it's you know often associated with violence and, and all that, which is, or this is, uh, it's totally arbitrary because same privilege could be allotted to the metaphorical because it is associated with a kind of truthfulness of language, then why can we not say that its metaphor is in itself literal? Unless, of course, um, that would disturb the whole system and then therefore we would see the, the crumbling of this binary split. So in this appreciation of the literal as evidence and connection to God's word, what we see is revealed the uh, parabolic nature of, of metaphysics and logocentrism. So I mean parabolic in like a parabola as a, as a kind of mathematical uh, graph or mathematical function on a graph where you have one point start, start from one point that goes into a direction but then comes back to the same point on the, um, I guess on the y-axis or the, not the same on the x-axis, whatever. Uh, it's, it's parabolic. So there is a tacit appreciation of pre-linguistic uh, kind of oral-based culture for being closer to God. Then there's a repudiation of representation of world in images and written word, which is, that's what we've been covering so far. However, in the phonocentrism of the written word, there is a return to the original connection to God. So like in the civil way of life, like with the alphabet where you have phonemes connected directly to things, sounds in the world, what we see is a, kind of a return to these, this immediate attachment to the world. How else could philosophers have contented themselves with writing unless they thought their writing to be like closer to God? So the ph philosopher was the one, Derrida says, that kind of catalyzed this, a move from poetry to prose in the history of the world. <laughs> so even, even in the most archaic forms of writing, like with cave paintings, we are confronted with a writing. So in his words, there is never a painting of the thing itself. And first of all, because there is no thing itself. So he goes on to into more detail about this, where uh, first pictorial representations, like, like cave paintings, were heterogeneous. That is, representations did not abide by a structure found in language. They were kind of all over the place. Every representation was just the creation of a single person that represented as close as they could the world. So it was heterogeneous. It took on different forms. So too can the same be said of the last stage of writing, this kind of alphabetized, um, detached writing from any kind of uh, structure in its own self because it's free-floating now, right? So we're ending the book kind of where we started here. So this writing was, for Rousseau, potentiated by trade and commerce where there was a desire to form a kind of lingua franca within language, a language is lingua franca, so that there would be um, a possibility for different people of different languages to connect with one another. So it was dropping structures of specific languages in favor of a kind of free-floating communicative one fostered by exchange and trade and stuff, where disparate people could communicate. So in this stage, there is a move from signifying rules to a kind of heterogeneous um, play of signification. So in his words here, Derrida's, Derrida's words, in the first case, presence of the represented thing in its perfect imitation, like with cave painting, and in the second, like with trade, the language fostered there, what we see is the self-presence of speech itself, where we have just speech not abiding by um, the coded regime of of um, writing. So all origins are then in, in both cases at the beginning and in the end in perpetual substitution. And here we have his words. It is this that the metaphysics of presence as self proximity wishes to efface by giving a privileged position to a sort of absolute now. The exterior is constitutive of exteriority or interiority, which is I, and that pretty much wraps it up here. And it's really the beginning to what Derrida is going to do in dissemination and writing indifference um, and really developing this. But, you know, you have to ask yourself when reading this text, 
was he successful at generating a science of um of writing this thing called grammatology and the answer in my mind is no because he doesn't actually set that out it's almost like this is just like um, an introduction to another book that hadn't been written yet uh it was kind of setting the stage here but in any case obviously great stuff um if you listen this far i'm gonna link up you could probably click on the screen here links to other derrida videos um but yeah if i did anything wrong i'd love to hear about it and uh if you had the time uh like share subscribe tell your friends um i would love that and yeah take care